I, um, I put this thing together uh, and puts me in the really precarious position of having to operate machinery while I talk, so bear with me. Um, thank you all very much for coming to listen to somebody talk about torture for an hour. Um, I really promise it's not as grim as all that. Um, I want to thank Penn Canada and, and Ryerson University and especially this International Issues Discussion Series, which is really, really amazing. Um, and I want to thank especially the American Civil Liberties Union, um, which did the Freedom of Information Action in the United States that produced all these documents and then gave me the opportunity to spend about a year and a half reading through them and kind of figuring out for myself the questions that I thought everybody in the United States should be asking. You know, what happened? Did we torture people? Was this torture or was this not torture? Who did we torture? Who did the torturing? Who was responsible for it? You know, but more than that, I thought, you know, I'm a writer, I'm also a citizen, and I, I was trying to, as I went through, I was trying to locate myself in this story. You know, what would I have done in this position? What are my reference points? Because we were being told all the time by our leaders that they were making the decisions that they had to make in order to protect us. So I was trying to sort of figure out, you know, who, who how ordinary Americans like me would have moved through this landscape. Um, I thought instead of just boringly reciting my conclusions, what I would do instead is sort of take you through some of the the process of discovery that I went through, looking at some of the documents, seeing how they fit together for me, and when they fit together, the, 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 the conclusions, how they sort of answered these questions for me. So, you know, but also because you get to see what the documentary record looks like. It's kind of incomplete, as you can see. This, <laughs> this is a page from the 2004 CIA Inspector General's report, which was an internal investigation about what the CIA was doing. And as you can see, it doesn't yield a whole lot of information. This is one of the first documents that I found. And it, what attracted my attention to it was that it is handwritten. It's very human. You know, you look at 140,000 pages of documents. They were boxes and stacks in my office. And I was like, how do you even begin? And they look really cold and really bureaucratic. But you start flipping it through, and all of a sudden you see Human hands are behind them, and human people, and human characters. I just, you know, take a look at this document. This is an incident report, a complaint that was, that was submitted, you see the date, 13 February 2002, remember that date. It's in Kandahar, Afghanistan. This woman is an interpreter, a military interpreter, in, in, a, in an interrogation at this forward operating base in Afghanistan. And she writes, she and her interrogator are interrogating somebody they take a break, and while they're gone, this group of special forces guy goes into the interrogation booth and starts beating the guy up. And she comes back, and you can see about halfway down, she says, blank, it's her, they redact the name of her partner. Blank and I finished the break and went back to continue the interrogation. When we entered the booth, we found the special forces members all crouched around the prisoner. Notice she says prisoner. They were blowing cigarette smoke in his face. The prisoner was extremely upset. It took a long time to calm him down and find out what had happened. The prisoner was visibly shaken and crying. Blank immediately told them to get out and not come back anywhere near anyone we were talking to. The prisoner said that they had hit him, told him he was going to die, blew smoke in his face, and shocked him with some kind of a device. He used the word electricity. Blank and I immediately notified our non-commissioned officer in charge what had happened. The chain of command took actions to ensure that nothing of that sort could happen again. A, a new policy was established uh, requiring that any of the special forces members who wanted to assist with the interrogation process had to first check in with, with the interrogation control element. The individuals who committed the, the acts were told that they were no longer welcome in the facility. I was very upset that such a thing could happen. I take my job and, and, and responsibilities as an interrogator and as a human being very seriously. I understand the importance of the Geneva Conventions and what it represents. If I don't honor it, what right do I have to expect any other military to do so? Look at the date on this document. This is January 25th, 2002. This is a very famous memo that Alberto Gonzalez wrote to President Bush in which he recommends that the United States withhold Geneva Convention prisoner of war protection 
from uh, Al-Qaeda and Taliban detainees. So you have this woman out there in the field who's relying on the Geneva Conventions at the very moment that the Bush administration is conspiring to withhold those protections to the to people that she's interrogating. You look on the right-hand side, what's really interesting is why they're proposing to do this. And the right-hand side just lifts the sort of fuzzy text over there. But you'll see, you'll see why they recommend this. Alberto Gonzalez, in, earlier in the memo, says, your determination that Geneva prisoners of war uh, protections do not apply would create a reasonable basis in law that Section 2441 of the War Crimes Act does not apply, which could provide a solid defense to any, so any future prosecution. And you'll see on the whole right side of that document explains that if you adhere to the uh, Geneva Conve Prisoner of War Conventions, these people could be prosecuted under the American War Crimes Act. Um, adhering to your determination that it does not apply would guard effectively against misconstruction or misapplication of Section 2441 for several reasons. First, some of the language of the, of the Geneva Conventions is undefined. Uh, it prohibits, for example, outrages upon personal dignity and inhuman treatment. And it is difficult to predict with confidence what actions might be deemed to constitute violations of the relevant provisions. Second, it is difficult to predict the needs and circumstances that would arise in the course of the war on terrorism. And third, it is difficult to predict the motives of prosecutors and independent counsels who may in the future decide to pursue unwarranted charges based on Section 2441. So I was struck by that story, right? We have American servants of men and women who are out there in the field who think they're playing by one set of rules. We have the White House who's rewriting the rules. And why are they rewriting the rules? Very specifically for one purpose, so that they're not prosecuted in the future for violating the legal structure that exists. So, you know, that revelation, that idea that, it, that it's very deliberate at the beginning, and it's, it's, it's in, in effect a conspiracy, right? We're going to do this, and this is our plan, and in order to do this, we have to do it in secrecy, because people are going to stop us, right? Every time a woman stumbles on what we're doing, they're going to complain. So they set about to set up a, a network of secret interrogation facilities. And I'll show you that the, the, the famous ones that you know are the CIA interrogation facilities. On the left is one of the famous torture memos. This is from August 1st, 2002. It's written by John Yu uh, of the Office of Legal Counsel to the White House, signed by Jay Bybee, who's now a federal judge in the United States. On the right-hand side, oh, this is called interrogation of an al-Qaeda operative. That al-Qaeda operative is a guy named Abu Zubaydah. I'm sure you've heard his name. Abu Zubaydah, we shot him in a raid in Pakistan, almost killed him, saved him, transported him to a secret prison in Thailand where we uh, started this interrogation routine. This memo is the memo that was written to, 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 to declare legal what would become known as enhanced interrogation techniques. On the right-hand side, you have Abu Zubaydah's description of what happened. You don't have to read it now because I'm going to flip to another slide. But the, one on the, 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 the testimony on the right was taken by the International Red Cross in October of 2002, four and a half years after he was detained by the United States. Those entire four and a half years, the Red Cross was unable to see him. We deliberately withheld, the, 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 we kept these prisoners in secret prisoners, in prisons that the ICRC had no access to. He was unable to tell his story to anybody. He was finally able to tell it in 2006 to the International Committee of the Red Cross. The International Committee of the Red Cross has a confidentiality agree agreement with all governments, so we weren't even supposed to see this, but it was leaked to the New Yorker magazine in 2006, and we got this testimony. What's interesting about these things as you can see, you can line these things up exactly with the instructions on the one hand and the approvals on the one hand, and what we did, or what he says happened to him on the other side. So if you look in the third one, for example, he talks, about, this is John Yu saying it's okay to put somebody in a little tiny box, to put them inside of it, they called it a confinement box. He says, in the legal language of the White House, cramped confinement involves the placement of an individual in a confined space, the dimensions of which restrict the individual's movement. The confined space is usually dark. The duration of the confinement varies based on the size of the container. For the larger confined space, the individual can stand up or sit down. 
The smaller space is large enough for the subject to sit down. Confinement in the larger space can last up to 18 hours. For the smaller space, confinement lasts from no more than two hours. Then there's the technique called walling. He says, for walling, a flexible wall will be constructed. The individual is placed with his heels touching the wall. The interrogator pulls the individual forward and then quickly and firmly pushes the individual into the wall. It is the individual's shoulder blades that hit the wall. During this motion, the head and neck are supported with a rolled hood or towel that produces a C-collar effect to prevent whiplash. To further reduce the probability of injury, the individual is allowed to rebound from the flexible wall. You have orally informed us, you as the CIA, you have orally informed us that the false wall is part, in part constructed to create, create a loud sound when the individual hits it, which will further shock or surprise the individual. That's the plan. Look at the bottom box on the right. This is Abu Zubaydah. When I was let out of the box, I saw that one of the walls of the room had been covered with plywood sheeting. From now on, it was against this wall that I was then smashed with a towel around my neck. I think the plywood was there to provide some absorption of the impact of my body. The interrogators realized that smashing me against the hard wall would probably quickly result in physical injury. During these torture sessions, many guards were present, plus two interrogators who did the actual beating, um, who, who did, plus two interrogators who did the actual beating still asking questions while, while the main interrogator left to return when the beating was over. After the beating, I was then placed in the small box. They placed a cloth or cover over the box to cut out all light and restrict my air supply. As it was not high enough to even sit upright, I had to crouch down. It was very difficult because of my wounds. The wound on my leg began to open and started to bleed. I don't know how long I remained in the small box. I think I may have slept or maybe fainted. In the Thai prison, in, in, the, in the secret prison in Thailand, the CIA videotaped all of these interrogations. There are 92 videotapes. Um, they existed for about four years after those interrogations. And then uh, in 2006, in spite of the fact that there had been numerous requests for all documents relating to the interrogations, the CIA destroyed those, those videotapes. Now, they would have been covered by the Freedom of Information Act request of the ACLU. So the ACLU went back to prison, back to, prison, back to court, and asked for any descriptions that the CIA had of what might be on those tapes. What they got was a list of cables that were sent, uh, what, what, telegraphs, that were telegrams that were sent back and forth between the black site and Washington between April of 2002 and September of 2002. 500 cables going back and forth between the, the torturers in Thailand and, and the CIA headquarters in Langley, essentially saying, today we want to hit him three times, throw him in the, into the wall twice, and put him in a box for an hour. Can we do that? And Washington saying, yes, you can do that. That sort of direct control going back and forth to Washington. The last thing that they did, which of course everybody knows, is they waterboarded him. And here's a little bit of a description of what that means. The first one is John Yu. Finally, you would like to use a technique called the waterboard. In this procedure, the individual is bound securely to an inclined bench, which is approximately four feet by seven feet. The individual's feet are generally elevated. A cloth is placed over his forehead and eyes. Water is then applied to the cloth in a controlled manner. As this is done, the cloth is lowered until it covers the nose and mouth. Once the cloth is saturated and completely covers the nose and mouth, the airflow is slightly restricted for 20 to 40 seconds due to the presence of the cloth. This causes an increase in carbon dioxide level of the individual's blood. This increase in the carbon dioxide level stimulates increased efforts to breathe. You have orally informed us that this procedure triggers an automatic physiological sensation of drowning that the individual cannot control, even though he may be aware that he is not, in fact, drowning. And then he goes on to argue, as with all the other techniques, the waterboard, which inflicts no pain or actual harm whatsoever, does not, in our view, inflict severe pain and suffering. Therefore, it does not violate the torture statute. Abu Zubaydah just describes this. I was then dragged from the small box, unable to walk properly, and put on what looked like a hospital bed, and strapped down very tightly with belts. A black cloth was then placed over my face, and the interrogators used a mineral water bottle to pour water on the cloth so that I could not breathe. After a few minutes, the cloth was removed, and the bed was rotated to an upright position. The pressure of the straps on my wounds was very painful. I vomited. I struggled against the straps, trying to breathe, but it was hopeless. I thought I was going to die. I lost control of my urine. Since then, I still lose, lose control of my urine under stress. 
On each occasion, I was suffocated once or twice and was put in the vertical position on the bed in between. On one, on one occasion, the suffocation was repeated three times, and I vomited each time. We waterboarded him 83 times in a week. We waterboarded him 82 times, and a cable went from Thailand to Washington from the interrogator saying, he's, he's got nothing else. He's got nothing more to say. We should stop. The CIA in Washington said, we don't believe you. They put agents on the plane to fly to the black site and ordered him waterboarded one more time until they were satisfied that he didn't know anything else. It's just, you know, the, 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 those cables, the, the contents of those cables, we still don't have those because those are not released. The CIA insists that those are still classified information. But the one-to-one the, the, the -one correspondence between instructions from Washington and and interrogation techniques in the field. There's just a clear uh, evidentiary track between the two. That's, you know, th this happened in the CIA secret prisons. It was a system of interrogation that was devised by these two psychologists, military psychologists, who worked in this program called the SEER program. It's Survive, Evade, Resist, Escape. And it's what we put our pilots through who, you know, as a training program, pilots who might get in planes that get shot down in enemy territory who are taken prisoner. And it's a sort of week-long simulation session. You're, you know, you're, you're, they pretend that you're a, a hostage or a prisoner of war of the North Koreans is the scenario that they used. The North Koreans took up a lot of our pilots captive during the Korean War. They tortured them by a very specific set of techniques, mostly into falsely confessing to war crimes. So we take our pilots to be, send them away to a week, do these simulated techniques, which include confinement in small boxes, nudity, cold temperatures, isolation, waterboarding, and put them through this. And almost all the, all the volunteers who go through this program end up confessing, even though they know that it's a simulated program by the end of the week. So the two psych these were two psychologists who worked for this program. They come to the White House in January 2002 and say, we've got a great idea. Let's take these techniques and use them on our captives. And we can like, use them, ramp them up a little bit, and really use them. And so they started to use them in the CIA black sites, first in Thailand. And then after this session of waterboarding, Abu Zubaydah and, and another uh, detainee get transferred to Poland where they're held then for another couple of years. Um, the military kind of likes what's happening. By this time, Guantanamo is opening, and they're st we're starting to move prisoners to Guantanamo. This is a memo from October. It's actually minutes from a meeting from October of 2002. This is in Guantanamo. We started moving prisoners, which is the correct term, Right? They're prisoners. We move them to Guantanamo, but by now we call them detainees because we don't give them Geneva prisoner of war protections. We call them detainees. We start moving prisoners from the theater of war in Afghanistan to Guantanamo in January 2002. By October of 2002, there are about 600 detainees in Guantanamo. We, the CIA goes into Guantanamo in August. They do an audit of all the prisoners. And they come back to Washington and say, we've got a problem because almost everybody in Guantanamo is, as somebody famously said, they're almost all dirt farmers, right? They're almost all little people or people who were accidentally detained or people who were sold to the U.S. by people who were turning in their enemies in order to make money. So they know we have very few Al-Qaeda higher level operatives or a Taliban higher level operatives in Guantanamo. The military is not happy about this, and, they want, and they're hearing all of these success stories that are coming out of the CIA black sites. So in October of 2002, the CIA lawyer, is a guy named Fredman, you'll see him on the right-hand side, takes a little field trip down to Guantanamo and has a meeting with, these are all characters who are from the military intelligence interrogators, inter interrogation staff in Guantanamo. And it's a little bit hard to read, but it's, some of the, I mean, it's got some of the most catchy dialogue of the whole story. Um, you'll see Colonel Cummings says, we can't do sleep deprivation. Lieutenant Colonel Beaver, who's a, a lawyer who will do a, a legal memo that's very much like the John Yu memo, saying that you can do these things. She says, yes, we can, with approval. Lieutenant Colonel Beaver, 
We may need to curb the harsher operations while the International Committee of the Red Cross is around. It is better not to expose them to any controversial techniques. We must have the support of the, Dep the Department of Defense. Becker, we have many reports from Bagram about sleep deprivation being used. Lieutenant Colonel Beaver, true, but officially it's not happening. It is not being reported officially. The ICRC is a serious concern. They will be in and out scrutinizing our operations unless they're displeased, displeased and decide to protest and leave. This would draw a lot of negative attention. They talk a little bit about a new PSYOPs plan. Fredman, this is the CIA lawyer. The Department of Justice has provided much guidance on the is this issue. The CIA is not held to the same rules as the military. In the past, when the Red Cross has made a big deal about certain detainees, the Defense Department has moved them away from the attention of the Red Cross. Upon questioning from the Red Cross about their whereabouts, the Defense Department's response has repeatedly been that the detainee merited no status under the Geneva Conventions. The CIA has employed aggressive techniques on less than a handful of suspects since 9-11. Under the Torture Convention, torture has been prohibited by international law, but the language of the statutes is written vaguely. Severe mental and physical pain is prohibited. The mental part is explained as poorly as the physical. Severe physical pain described as anything causing permanent damage to major organs or body parts. Mental torture described as anything leading to permanent profound damage to the senses or personality. It is basically subject to perception. If the detainee dies, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> the reason that we have these minutes, it's an amazing document, and it would not have been declassified, but for this. It was attached to this. This is an email from a guy, uh, let's see, a, uh, the guy named Mark Fallon. Mark is a member of the Naval Criminal Investigation Task Force. They're the military's version of the FBI. They, there are two major branches of the U.S. intelligence services that refuse to participate in any abusive interrogations from the very beginning. One is the Criminal Investigative Task Force of the military, and the other is the FBI. So this guy, Mark Fallon, sees these minutes. They sort of come across his desk. And he writes this email to a guy named Sam McMahon, who's the lead, the chief counsel for the Criminal Investigation Task Force. He says, Sam, we need to ensure seniors at the Office of General Counsel are aware of the 170, that's the name of the task force in Guantanamo, strategies, and how it might impact CITF and commissions. It looks like the kinds of stuff congressional hearings are made of. Uh, quotes from Lieutenant Colonel Beaver regarding things be that are not being reported give the appearance of impropriety. Other comments like, it is basically subject to perception. If the de detainee dies, you're doing it wrong. And any of the techniques that lie on the harshest end of the spectrum must be performed by highly trained individual medic individuals and medical personnel should be present to treat any possible accidents seem to stretch beyond the bounds of legal propriety. Talk of wet towel treatment, they go on to talk about waterboarding which results in the lymphatic gland reacting as if you're suffocating, would, in my opinion, shock the conscience of any legal body looking at using the results of the interrogation or possibly even the interrogators. Someone needs to be considering how history looks back at this. And as I was going through the documents, I started to see more and more of these kinds of things. I thought I'd just read you a couple of more. Something from Iraq and August of 2003, and 2003 is when the Sunni uprising is really taking hold in Iraq. And so suddenly there's IEDs are going off everywhere, we're losing a lot of troops. And Washington now gets the idea of taking these techniques and exporting them to Iraq. And they send around a memo that says, the gloves are coming off, gentlemen, regarding the detainees. Redacted, that's military intelligence, has made it clear we want these individuals broken. Uh, casualties are mounting and, mounting, and we need to start gathering info to help, uh, to help protect our soldiers from further attack. We know about that memo because an interrogator in the field in Iraq sent around a cover memo or a cover email saying, as for the gloves need to come off, we need to take a deep breath and remember who we are. Those gloves are based on clearly established standards of international law to which we are signatories and in part originators. Those in turn derive from practices commonly accepted as morally correct, the so-called usages of war. 
It comes down to standards of right and wrong, something we cannot put aside when we find it convenient, any more than we, than we can decide that we will take no prisoners, the, uh, and sh therefore shoot those who surrender to us just because we find the process inconvenient. The record, the reason that we have 140,000 pages of documents is because of people like this. It's all the people inside the military and in the intelligence service who protested these things, who filed reports, who launched investigations, and, and brought, about, brought, brought us this incredible paper trail uh, of what happened. There are a couple of, um, I think what they did, a, a couple of people committed themselves to writing in ways that I think have produced real literature. And I thought I'd just read it one section and then show you a clip from another. Uh, you know, just the gesture of writing something down and the courage of doing that at a moment like that um, is, I think, a really interesting, uh, uh, shows a lot of faith in the power of writing and also, I think, like I say, a lot of courage. There was a guy named Almer Alberto Mora. Alberto Mora was the chief counsel of the Navy. Um, and like most people, even, th this is the Navy's senior lawyer. The Navy is in charge of Guantanamo, it's a naval base. But their senior lawyer has no idea what's happening in these interrogations in Guantanamo. They're closely sealed off by military interrogators. But this guy, Mark Fallon, who writes this note, goes to Alberto Mora, goes to Washington, and said, there's stuff going on down there that you should know about. Alberto, and he's heard, describes it. Um, and Alberto Mora says, I need to know more. And at the time, we're interrog interrogating a guy named Mohammed al Qatani. Mohammed al Qatani was suspected of being the 20th hijacker. He had tried to enter the United States in Orlando, Florida, a month before the 9-11 attacks. A customs agent wouldn't allow him in because his paperwork wasn't in order. And he got sent back. He ended up getting picked up in Afghanistan about four months after the war started, brought to Gu Guantanamo, the following summer, the FBI is going through fingerprints and they match up that this guy um, was this guy that we turned away a month before the attacks. And so they send down a crew with, with, with instructions from Rumsfeld, very specific, for a special project, they called it, which was a 50-day interrogation of 20, 20-hour day interrogations, four hours of sleep, uh, cold rooms, ridiculous humiliations, put it, dressing him up in a bra and panties, you know, slapping him, you know, relentless, relentless, and relentless. So this guy Fallon is sitting there reading the intelligence reports and figuring out something's going on with this guy. So he and his buddies in the CITF start to gather information. They go to Alberto Mora in Washington, the chief counsel of the Navy, and he immediately launches a rebellion against this within the Pentagon. And he goes, um, he goes toe to toe with the guy named Jim Haynes, who's the who's Rumsfeld's chief lawyer and approved all of these techniques. He writes a memo in which he describes what's happening and he thre threatens to publish the, publish the memo publicly unless the interrogation techniques are stopped. He's told they'll stop, he goes on vacation, comes back, he hears they're still going on. So he says, I delivered that memo in draft form to Mr. Haynes' office in the morning. In a telephone call, I told Mr. Haynes that I was increasingly uncomfortable as time passed because I had not put down in writing my view on the interrogations is interrogation issues. I said I would be signing out the memo late that afternoon unless I heard definitively that the use of the interrogation techniques had been or was being suspended. We agreed to meet later that day. In the later meeting, which Mr. Del Orto attended, Mr. Haynes returned the draft to me he asked whether I was not aware of how he felt about the issues or the impact of my actions. I responded that I did not. And with respect to my own views, I had no idea whether he agreed totally with my arguments, disagreed totally with them, or held an intermediate view. Mr. Haynes then said that Secretary Rumsfeld would be suspending the authority to apply the techniques that same day. I said I was delighted and would thus not be signing out my memo. Later in the day and after our meeting, Mr. Haynes called to confirm that Secretary Rumsfeld had suspended the techniques. I reported the news widely, including to the Undersecretary of the Navy. That rebellion only lasts for about two months. Rumsfeld 
gathers a new group of lawyers, including John Yu, to write a new memo that reapproves these techniques. He doesn't tell Alberta Mora, and within six months, they're doing the same thing they did to Katani, to a guy named Mohamed Uslahi in Guantanamo. But the next group of people who object to this are actually not interrogators, but the guys who are sent to Guantanamo to prosecute these people. Um, and one of these guys is a guy named Daryl Vandevelt. Daryl Vandevelt is sent to prosecute this 17-year-old kid named Mohammed Jawad. Um, this is a little clip of a couple of people reading an affidavit that, that Daryl Vandevelt submitted in the habeas corpus case, the, the habeas corpus petition of this guy, Mohammed Jawad, who he was sent to prosecute in Guantanamo. Um, the first person who's reading is a guy named Mo Davis, Lieutenant Colonel Mo Davis. Mo Davis was the chief prosecutor in Guantanamo. He was Daryl Vandevelt's boss. Both of these guys resigned when they, uh, rather than do these prosecutions. Um, this is a bit of a, what I think is one of the most beautifully written the documents. In 2007, a few months before I resigned as chief prosecutor for the military commissions at Guantanamo Bay, Lieutenant Colonel Daryl Vandeville joined my staff, and I assigned him to the case of Mohammed Jawad. In 2008, Lieutenant Colonel Vandeville, feeling uh, an ethical conflict, removed himself from the case and provided a sworn statement to the ACLU as part of Mr. Jawad's habeas corpus petition. This is a portion of Lieutenant Colonel Vandeville's sworn statement. I, Darrell Bendo, declare as follows. I am a lieutenant colonel in the Judge Advocate General Court. Since the September 2001 attacks, I have served in Bosnia, Africa, Iraq, and Afghanistan. My awards include the Bronze Star Medal, the Iraqi Campaign Medal, and two Joint Meritorious Unit Awards. I offer this declaration in support of Mohammed Jawad's position for a Hades Corps. I was the lead prosecutor assigned to the military commission's case against Mr. Jawad until my resignation in September 2008. Initially, the case appeared to be a simple street crime as I had prosecuted by the dozens in my civilian life. But eventually, I began to harbor serious doubts about the strength of the evidence. Mr. Jawad was alleged to have thrown a grenade at U.S. troops, but the victims of the attack had not seen the attacker. At least three other Afghans had been arrested for the crime and had subsequently confessed casting considerable doubt on the claim that Mr. Jawad was solely responsible for the attack. And I learned that the written statement characterized as Jawad's personal confession could not possibly have been written by him because Jawad was functionally illiterate and could not read nor write. The statement was not even in his native language. I also found evidence that Mr. Jawad had been badly mistreated by U.S. authorities in both Afghanistan and Guantanamo. Mr. Jawad's prison records referred to a suicide attempt, a suicide which he sought to accomplish by banging his head repeatedly against one of the cell walls. The records reflected 112 unexplained moves from cell to cell over a two-week period, an average of eight moves per day for 14 days. Mr. Jawad had been subjected to a sleep deprivation program known as the Frequent Flyer Program. I lack the words to express the heart sickness I experienced when I came to understand the pointless, purely gratuitous mistreatment of Mr. Jawad and my fellow soldiers. It is my opinion, based on my extensive knowledge of the case, that there is no credible evidence or legal basis to justify Mr. Jawad's detention in U.S. custody or his prosecution by military commission. Holding Mr. Jawad for six years with no resolution of this case, with no terminus in sight, is something beyond a travesty. That affidavit actually ends with what I believe is one of the most perfect sentences I've ever read in the English language uh, in the last paragraph, and I, I thought I'd, I would just read that. Uh, Daryl Vandevelt asks, he doesn't resign, he asks instead to be re redeployed to Iraq or Afghanistan. Instead they say, no, you're close enough to end at the end of your term, you know, you can, um, you can retire back to the United States. So he says, I did not quit the commissions. He asked to be transferred, and he says, in the exercise of his wisdom and discretion, my, the Judge Advocate General permitted me to be released from active duty. And he says, however, had I been returned to Afghanistan and, or Iraq, 
And had I encountered Mohammed Jawad in either of those hostile lands, where two of my friends have been killed in action, and another one of my very best friends in the world has been terribly wounded, I have no doubt at all, none, that Mr. Jawad would pose no threat whatsoever to me, his former prosecutor and now repentant persecutor. An amazing sentence. So it's, again, this story for me was driven by these characters who were the dissenters to this program. These were the ones, as I, you know, you found through the documents, the people that really represented, I thought, the people that I understood us to be, you know? And they're the ones who, in fact, by 2004, had more or less stopped the most extreme excesses of the program. Uh, in 2004, the, the FBI launched a huge internal investigation of its own operations to see how its agents had, whether they had participated in any abusive interrogations. And the Justice Department kept that report. That was one of the declassified elements of the record. This is just an interesting and kind of ominous handwritten note that haunts me, because I only looked at three parts of this 140,000-page record. I only looked at what we had about the black sites, what we had about Guantanamo, and what we had about renditions to third countries. I didn't look at any of the documents from Afghanistan. I didn't look at any of the documents from Iraq, which is a huge, huge trove of documents. You see this handwritten note. This is from an FBI investigator's interview with an agent who spent time in Guantanamo during this most abusive period. You see they talk about number 63. That's this guy, Mohammed al um, during that interrogation. Uh, he says toward the bottom, Camp X-ray was locally where harsh techniques were used. And then he quotes the person that he was interviewed. If you think this is tough, you should see what's happening in Afghanistan. So there's a whole bunch of other documents out there to read that will tell more of the story of what the woman at the beginning, that interrogator, were seeing in Afghanistan. So why were we doing this? That, you know, that's really the next question. It's clear that we were doing it. So what was the purpose of this? We know what we're told the purpose was, right? We're told that we assume that these people have intelligence information about impending attacks, and it's essential to, to use these techniques in order to get them to tell us these things to prevent attacks. Um, but we're, we're starting to get a record in the last three, we're starting to get a sense from the record that's come out in the last three or four years that something else was entirely was going on by about 2003 and 2004. And that's a record that's coming from habeas corpus cases that have been decided in Washington. This is a memorandum opinion in the decision of the habeas corpus peti petition of a guy named Farhi Saeed bin Mohammed. It's from this judge named uh, uh, Gladys Kessler. It was released in November of 2009. Farhi was, you know, the, he was being held because we said he was an enemy combatant. We said he was an enemy combatant because we said that he had trained at an Al-Qaeda training camp in Afghanistan. That evidence, it turned out, came in almost entirely from testimony from a guy named Binyam Mohammed, uh, who was also in Guantanamo. You'll see in the, next, in the second page, this, uh, in, in ordering that this guy, Farhi, Saeed bin Mohammed be released after eight years, by the way. Um, the judge says, first, Binyam Mohammed, this is the person who's testified against the petitioner, Binyam Mohammed's lengthy and brutal experience in detention weighs heavily with the court. For example, this is not a case where a person was repeatedly questioned by a police officer in his own country by his own fellow citizens at a police station over several days without sleep and with only a minimum amount of food and water a U.S. case in determining what amounted to brutality or a brutal interrogation. She said, the difference, of course, is that Binyam Mohammed's trauma lasted for two long years. During that time, he was physically and psychologically tortured. His genitals were mutilated. He was deprived of sleep and food. He was sum summarily transported one from one foreign prison to another. Captors held him in stress positions for days at a time. He was forced to listen to piercingly loud music and the screams of other prisoners while locked in a pitch black cell. All the while, he was forced to inculpate himself and others in various plots to imperil Americans. 
The government does not dispute this evidence. Next page. This is later. In this case, even though the identity of the individual interrogators changed from nameless Pakistanis to Moroccans to Americans and to a special agent, there is no question that throughout his ordeal, Binyam Muhammad was being held at the behest of the United States. Captors changed the sites of his detention and frequently changed his location within each detention facility. He was shuttled from country to country and interrogated and beaten without having access to counsel until arriving at Guantanamo Bay after being re-interrogated by special agent X. From Binyam Mohammed's perspective, there was no legitimate reason to think that transfer to Guantanamo Bay foretold more humane treatment. It was, after all, the third time that he had been forced onto a plane and shuttled to a foreign country where he would be held under the United States authority. Further, throughout his detention, a, a constant barrage of physical and psychological abuse was employed in order to manipulate him and program into telling investigators what they wanted to hear. It was more than plausible that, in an effort to please Special Agent Blank, consistent with how captors taught him to behave, he retold such a story, adding details such as petitioner's president, presence at training, which he thought would be helpful and, above all, would bring an end to his nightmare. Binyam Mohammed is now a free man. He's living in the UK. Last year, the, the government of Britain awarded him and 13 other British-based detainees who were in Guantanamo uh, substantial sum, millions of dollars, for complicity in their treatment. Binyam Mohammed's story is amazing, and it's, there, it uh, takes up a section of the book that's called, I call it a Ponzi scheme. Binyam Mohammed, is, he, he's Ethiopian, he actually lived in Washington, D.C. for a while, went to London, his family moved back, he stayed there, he kind of, you know, had trouble, he went to junior college, had trouble in school, started using drugs, and by the time he was about 21 or 22, he had a bit of a drug problem. He joined a mosque in his neighborhood. He decided to turn his life around, so he went to Afghanistan. Um, and when he was there, like a lot of young men his age, thought that he was going to, you know, maybe go to a training camp and possibly go and fight in Chechnya, which was sort of the destination of choice in about 2000, 1999 or 2000. Um, he gets picked up in May of 2002 right about the same time as this American guy, Jose Padilla, gets picked up, arriving in Chicago in the United States. They get picked up right at the time that Abu Zubaydah, remember him, in Thailand, who's being tortured? Abu Zubaydah is being tortured and says under torture two things. He says there's a plot to destroy shopping malls in America. And I don't know if you remember, but there was a huge red alert about shopping malls in the United States. And then the other thing that Abu Zubaydah says is, oh yeah, and by the way, Al-Qaeda has radiological weapons. We have a dirty bomb. They, you know, we're working on a dirty bomb. And there was, like, uh, there was like this American guy and this other guy, and they were talking about this. So they've got Padilla in Chicago. They move him to the Navy brig in, in South Carolina. They have Binyo Mohammed in Pakistan. They send British agents to interrogate him. The CIA interrogates him. They send him then to Morocco, where he spends two years in a prison where they cut him, including cutting his penis with a scalpel when he's in the prison. He's there for two years. And during those two years, what they're doing is they're interrogating Jose Padilla in South Carolina, Abu Zubaydah by then in Poland, and Binyam Mohammed in Morocco in this round robin interrogation about their plot. And every time they go around, the plot gets more amazing, right? So they're starting out. Now, the first plot, they're going to do a, explode a dirty bomb in New York. Then there's, a, then there's a plot for them to turn on the na rent apartments, turn on the natural gas, put metal plates in the side of the wall to sort of deflect the explosion, and the, the buildings will fall down. And they, they, their charge sheets keep getting longer and longer and longer. Meanwhile, when Binyam Mohammed is in Morocco, the U.S. starts to come, the agents start to come to him with books of photographs of detainees in Guantanamo, and they start interrogating him about who these people are. They move him out of Morocco when they figure he's finally broken. They move him to a place called the Dark Prison, which is a CIA secret prison in Afghanistan, where they literally keep the lights off 24 hours a day and play like Metallica when the bodies hit the floor and screaming Halloween noises 24 hours a day. And they sit him down and they coach him on these photographs, people he's never met before. So when he gets to Guantanamo, 
he then sits down and, and writes these testimonies about including this guy, Farhi bin Saeed bin Mohammed, who he's never met. So what it begins to look like and becomes clear is the more that this is going on, the more they're using coercion for the same reason that people have always used torture, which is to get people to confess falsely to things, either things that they've done or to implicate other people. And that's the record that we're starting to get slowly now as these court cases uh, come about. What's really interesting in Binyam Mohammed's case is the way that the United States has worked really hard to suppress his story. And I think I'm just going to end with this, but it's, I think, one of the most shocking layers of censorship that's been, um, been put on the story. This is, this is seven paragraphs from a, a decision of a, a, the, uh, a Court of Appeals in the United Kingdom in a case involving Binyam Mohammed. Binyam Mohammed, there was a period between about 2004 and 2008 when repeatedly the Bush administration went to Congress and got Congress to strip habeas corpus rights for detainees. What is habeas corpus? You know, that ancient, uh, the, the writ of habeas corpus, which allows uh, anybody who's in detention to challenge their detention in court. Uh, and the, the Bush administration said at one point, there's no habeas corpus rights. The Supreme Court said, well, in fact, there is, unless Congress says so. The Bush administration went to Congress twice, got the Military Commissions Act passed, and then the Detainee Treatment Act, and then the Military Com Commissions Act. Both of those stripped habeas petition rights for detainees, so they couldn't tell their story to anyone. They couldn't go to court and tell the stories. The second time, Binyam had already had a habeas petition in the court. The, M the MCA gets passed, he can't go back to court, he can't present his story to anybody. His lawyers are trying to get information that they know the government has about how he was treated in Pakistan, in Morocco, in the dark prison, and in Guantanamo, because this is exculpatory evidence, they call it, right? It's evidence that shows that this testimony that you've given was forced or coerced under torture. The US government won't turn it over. So Binyam, who, who's British-based and has a British attorney, his attorney files suit in the UK asking the government of Britain to turn over to them 42 documents that the CIA sent to Britain early on, when, just when Binyam was in Pakistan, when we first captured him, describing what we were doing to him in Pakistan. 42 documents. And Binyam's attorneys say, we need those documents so we can show that he was tortured. The U.S. government says to the British government, do not release those documents. The British government says, okay, we will not do it. The court in Britain says, no, you can't do that. You have got to release these documents. And they, they say, tomorrow we're going to issue an order on this case, stand by. The next day, the, the U.S. government drops all of its charges against Binyam Mohammed in Guantanamo. He's facing capital charges for the dirty bomb plot. The, the day after the British court says, we're going to order the release of these documents to his attorneys, the U.S. drops all charges, and with, within eight months, he's a free man. But the most amazing part of the story is these seven paragraphs, which were going to be in the order, ordering those documents released, are redacted from the court ruling because the US government goes to Britain and says, if you publish those paragraphs, not just the documents, if you publish those paragraphs describing the documents, we will cut our intelligence sharing relationship with the UK. We will no longer cooperate with you in intelligence. So the court redacts those, all of those paragraphs, just the paragraphs themselves, um, until the judge in the habeas corpus case of Farid Said bin Mohammed releases her ruling documenting all of the things that happened to Binyam Mohammed. And then the British court says, well, it's all now available in the United States, so we're going to release those seven paragraphs. These are the seven paragraphs that were so threatening that the United States was threatening to break its intelligence relationship with Britain. And just the last three are the good ones. 
It was clear not only from the reports of the content of the interviews, these are 42 documents from the CIA describing his first seven days in detention in Pakistan, the content of the interviews, but also from the report that he was being kept under self-harm observation, that the interviews were having a marked effect upon him and causing him significant mental stress and suffering. We regret to have to conclude that the reports provide to the CIS provided to the CIS made clear that anyone reading them that Binyam Mohammed was being subjected to the treatment we have described and the effect upon him of that intentional treatment. The treatment reported, if it had been administered on behalf of the United Kingdom, would clearly have been in breach of the undertakings given by the United Kingdom in 1972, signing the Convention Against Torture. Although it is not necessary for us to categorize the treatment reported, it could readily be contended to be at the very least cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment by United States authorities. The, like I said at the beginning, I think you know, this all happened because of secrecy and because of levels and levels of secrecy that were imposed on this process throughout this process. And there, I think that secrecy was imposed specifically to keep us from hearing two sets of voices. The first set is this set we heard several of, which were the people who protested these things, right, who made this documentary record. And the second set of voices, the voices that we still haven't heard are the voices of the detainees themselves, you know, just to keep us from hearing their stories. Um, Binyam Mohammed received a settlement from the UK government. Part of that settlement included a, a gag order. <coughs> He agreed not to talk to the press in exchange for at least getting compensation for what he had gone through. Last week, there was like an absolutely amazing scene in Guantanamo. You know, there's a trial, they are having military commission trials in Guantanamo of the five principal 9-11 um, uh, uh, plotters, including colleague Sheikh Mohammed. We've set up a courtroom in Guantanamo that looks like an ordinary courtroom except the, there's a glass wall that separates the gallery where the journalists sit from the court. That's a soundproof glass wall. And when you're sitting behind that wall, you're listening to the proceedings on a 40 second delay. And inside the court, there's a guy sitting next to the judge with his finger on a button. And that button is hit every time the conversation moves into classified material. And this is from the, 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 um, the judge's protective order that was issued at the beginning of these proceedings describing what the classified information is. Classified will be all information relating to the capture of the accused or the location of the CIA's black sites in which the accused were once imprisoned. Also classified are the conditions in which the accused were held and the interrogation methods used against them. Anytime any of those subjects come up, anytime Khalid Sheikh Mohammed says, oh, by the way, they waterboarded me 183 times when I told them that, somebody hits that button. So last week, in this just a procedural hearing, journalists are sitting there watching, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's lawyer is talking, and all of a sudden the red light goes on, and it's like a swirling barber pole light, and this white noise machine starts. And they're looking, and the, the person who's supposed to be sitting in the courtroom pushing that button is like looking around going, what, what, I'm not doing it, right? And there's this whole redact, or a whole censored section, and the judge is looking around. The next day, the judge has a fit, because it turns out nobody knew, but there's somebody else that's listening, and that's the CIA in, in Langley, Virginia, has its own button <laughs> that it can censor the proceedings. The judge didn't know it. None of the attorneys knew it. The judge went ballistic. And he said, we're not having any more, any more hearings until you disconnect that button. Nobody gets to censor these hearings but me. Um, and that's where we are. But you know, I mean, imagine how does that even begin to sound like a fair trial? You know, and this is the, the just sort of layers and layers and layers of censorship that go on. I mean, I think, you know, when I think about the experience of writing this book, I think that there are two things that really strike me. One is, I think, the level of conspiracy that went into planning and carrying out these things. I mean, we deliberately planned to violate the Convention Against Torture. We created the, the, the conditions that we could do it. 
You can only do it out of sight. We set up the conditions that we did it. We kept very few, kept the International Committee of the Red Cross from knowing it. We kept most of our servicemen and women from knowing it, most of our intelligence officers from knowing it. Every time people found out, they objected to it, sometimes incredibly heroically. Um, and again, those are the stories that really stand out in the record. But again, the people that we still haven't heard from mostly are the people that we did this to, um, and, uh, and that censorship system is still going on. So I think I'll leave it at there and, an and answer questions. I hope that just sort of gives you an idea of what it was like to go through the documents and, you know, and sort of put these things together and, and uh, see where we are.